The long road he's traveled began just after the Second World War, amidst the chaos of London's bustling West End. Born Stephen Dimitri Giorgio in 1948, he was the youngest of three children. His older brother David says Stephen stood out from the very start. My brother was an extremely beautiful child, and so much so that we used to go out, and my mother would go out for walks and stuff like that with the stroller. People would stop us just to have a look at the of this beautiful baby. As years went by, the boy grew high and the village up down in all. His mother Ingrid was Swedish with a mild disposition. His father Stavros was a spirited Greek Cypriot whose presence could be felt blocks away. He had a very loud voice and he was always shouting for Stevie or David and it really was deafening. Um, and that's the kind of environment he, he grew up in. The neighborhood remains much as it was when the Giorgio family lived in cramped quarters above the restaurant they ran in the West End. The Moulin Rouge put food on the Giorgio's table, and Stephen was pressed into service at a tender age. I was trained very early on, you know, to, to be able to, to work in the restaurant, to serve, to be a waiter. I, that's how I learned to first serve, you know, the public. Remember the days of the old schoolyard? We used to laugh a lot. Stephen attended St. Joseph's Catholic School, where the nun's stern warning about the wages of sin left a lasting impression. It was the awakening of my conscience. But of course, the messages I, I was receiving were, uh, were both different. You know, one was in the church, was warning me, you know, about the, uh, uh, the, the fleshly pleasures of life, and the other one was actually attracting me towards it. Oh, I can't keep it in. I can't keep it in. I've got to let it out. Stephen was no choir boy. He and his best friend Andrew Karitsis often played hooky, running the streets of the city's seedier side, slipping into movie houses, scaling rooftops, and playing pinball. That was our playground, which was the West End, really. Quite dangerous, if you think about it, at that kind of age. But we uh, experimented with most things, but uh, yeah, we had a good time. Good laugh, good laugh, good friends. Now every second down the road, the West End was tough, but its vibrant musical theater scene held a special fascination for Stephen. I'd be hanging around the stage door, listening to, to the music and meeting the uh, cast. Um, West Side Story, you know, gave me a kind of a new vision of, 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 uh, of life. Stephen had always hoped to become a painter, but now he confided in his elder brother that he wanted to chase a different dream. One day he came to me and he said, uh, David, I'm going to be a singer. I said, a singer? So you're going to be an artist. He said, no, I'm going to be a singer. I said, all right, then uh, why don't you sing something for me? So he started to, to sing this song. I said, you'll never be a singer. Yes, I'm going to be a pop star now. Yes, I'm going to be a pop star. It was suddenly an explosion, and there were the Beatles who had opened up a whole new window of opportunity for kids like me, and, uh, and all you needed was a guitar. Oh, mama, mama, see me, mama, mama, see me on the TV. The teenager persuaded his father to buy him his first guitar, and he retreated to his room above the restaurant. There, he immersed himself in music. I suppose it was my retreat. I had all my records there, which, which were just by the side of my bed, so I could you know, go to sleep while the record was playing. And um, uh, it, it, it was, in a way, my own little world. In 1964, Stephen, Andrew Karitsis, and another pal formed a band of sorts. But only minutes into their first gig, it was obvious who the real star was. Oh, mama, mama, see me. Mama, mama, see me on my first gig. Slowly, we kind of like disappeared behind Stephen. <laughs> and we slowly shrank behind him. And he just out there, he was giving it his all, you know, and he was, he was very good. In the end, I, I realized I, I better go it alone. So the ambitious young artist went to work, writing songs at a furious pace. Baby, we're back to the good old times, and that's for sure. A year passed, and um, I said, well, okay, sing me some songs then. And he started to sing some songs. And I turned around to him and said, 
I think you're going to be a star. Stephen now had his once skeptical big brother in his corner. David became an irrepressible force determined to get Stephen discovered. I went to a restaurant right on the corner of Timpan Alley. I went into the restaurant. I stood up on a chair. I said, everybody, quiet! Because I knew it was full of people from the business. I need somebody in here to give me a name and address. I have a genius brother. He's a great singer. Somebody in here, please help me. The first cut is the deepest. Baby, I know the first cut is the deepest. David's stunt worked. Through contacts he made that night, Stephen landed a small publishing deal. But his recording career didn't really get rolling until Stephen knocked on the door of producer manager Mike Hurst. The doorbell went, and there's this kid standing there with a guitar case. And he said, uh, I wonder if you'd like to hear some of my songs. And I looked at him and I said, what, now? He said, yeah. First song he played was called I Love My Dog. I love my dog as much as I love for you. I looked at this guy when he finished and I said, you're bloody great. I said, that's a hit. All he asks from me is the food to give him strength. All he ever needs is love and that he knows he'll get. I said, uh, what do you call yourself? And he looked very sheepish, very worried. And he said, um, oh, he said, my name's Steve. He said, but he said, they call me Cat Stevens. And I said, that's great. Oh, no, he said. I said, yeah, it is. I said, why did he call you cat? You know, he said, a girl thinks I got eyes like a cat. I'm going to get rid of it. I said, no. I said, don't get rid of it. I said, this is a great name. Here comes my baby. Here she comes now. Hearst quickly signed the newly christened Cat Stevens. And within weeks, they had a deal with Derham Records, a new offshoot of the Decca label. From there, you know, Mike became my number one man, you know, the man who's going to take me into the business. When his next album, Catch Bullet 4, hit the racks in September 1972, it became an instant bestseller, quickly making its way to number one. Audiences couldn't get enough of Cat. In October 1966, his first single, I Love My Dog, clawed its way onto the British charts, peaking at number 28. We had to transistor radios and those those little things, crackly things, and then suddenly somebody said, it's on, you know, <laughs> we went darting outside, was, I remember the spot exactly, it was just outside the shop, and I can't remember who was, mum, whoever was with me, and we were listening to this, you know, I love my dog, and that was the beginning. Two months later, his next single, Matthew and Son, exploded. The head of promotion, Decca Records, comes charging down the stairs, says, Mike, he said, you want to know what our sales were up to lunchtime today? I said, what? He said, 90,000 by lunch. Matthew and Son shot to number two in the UK. Mike Hurst had taken a scruffy kid from London's West End and transformed him into England's hottest teen sensation. He got out of the car with all these girls screaming, and there must have been, I don't know, 30? 30 girls going berserk and his head disappeared in the melee and I tell you what I saw sleeves going here and these shoes and they virtually almost stripped him it was unbelievable I feel cold and I want to get you by my side the attention was overwhelming but Cat Stevens was in demand he toured with an unlikely all-star lineup that included romantic crooner Engelbert Humperdinck and rock revolutionary Jimi Hendrix Engelbert Humperdinck, he'd teach me how to drink port and brandy. Better bring another bottle with it, baby. Other substances, I suppose, which I learnt maybe from Jimi Hendrix and that crowd. Uh, that was a very, very, you know, I would say taxing uh, period on, on my health. And it was taxing on his relationship with Mike Hurst. Streetwise Stevens was becoming his own man. Perhaps lost a bit of my innocence very early on, but I never lost my conscience, and I think that was perhaps a very important point to my whole life, is that I was always protective of my soul, and I never really sold out to anybody. Cat was running himself ragged, touring, recording, and writing around the clock. His health suffered from the relentless pace. Exhausted, Cat sought medical advice. In March of 68, he was diagnosed with a potentially fatal disease, tuberculosis. The doctor that actually, actually discovered that he had TB said to him that, you know, you only had a couple of weeks of life left in you. You would have been dead. 
The frightened 21-year-old was rushed to King Edward VII Hospital outside London. Forced to rest, he began to contemplate the path he was on. Trouble, oh, trouble move from me. I really didn't want to leave this world without knowing where I was going. And that was where I started my search. Looking into the self, trying to find that place of peace where nobody could bother you. Not even death itself. And so my mind begins to memorize. Cause time will never seem the same. The reluctant pop star was finally able to take stock of the wild ride he'd been on for the past two years. He started to think about the future. He wasn't that happy with himself at that stage. Cat Stevens, in a sense, hadn't really been born in the true sense. Left alone in his hospital room, he could finally follow his heart, a soul-searching trek that would lead to some of the most introspective songs of a generation. But the more adulation the star received, the more he withdrew. Like many in his generation, Cat was seeking answers to his growing sense of spiritual emptiness. He explored Eastern religions and New Age philosophies, topics he'd been interested in for years. My search was going on at the same time as I was playing, you know, 40,000 seaters in, in Houston. You know, and, and that kind of uh, paradox was with me. Uh, in a way, throughout my life, I had this kind of, you know, this, uh, this ability to kind of cross uh, thresholds. Keen to step out of the mainstream, he left England and his usual studio team to record an album in Jamaica with session musicians. Released in July of 73, the aptly titled Foreigner sold well of his Upon his return from Africa, a wandering Cat Stevens went back into the studio. Reunited with Paul Samuel Smith and guitarist Alan Davies, he recorded an album with a more familiar sound, but the title reflected a man increasingly torn between two worlds. I was traveling on, on some plane to a gig, and I had my little sort of uh, icon, sort of Buddha statue thing, which I used to carry around with me, and, and I had a bo chocolate box in the other hand, so, so I said, look at that, you know. And if I was to die in this, in this plane, you know, where would I be between these, the material and the spiritual? Cat Stevens was more than a big star, he was a big business. And after recording and touring non-stop for nearly five years, he was exhausted. I'm sure I was pretty difficult to, to be with sometimes because, you know, I was looking for my identity and I was a chameleon. In his constant quest for answers, Cat latched on to another philosophy, numerology, which seeks to explain the mysteries of the universe through mathematics. Why was I born a nine cursed repeatedly? The experience inspired the ambitious concept album he called Numbers. Released in October 1975, it sold quite well, but was far from radio friendly, and record executives were left wondering where all the hits had gone. No, if I should die, no one needed me. At one time, Jerry Moss said it, it just sounds as if he's finding much more difficulty getting something, getting a song out, you know, because there'd be all kind of arrangements and complications, and then even the album graphics, everything became much more complicated. In 1975, just before he was to undertake another major tour, an anxious Cat Stevens visited Jerry Moss at his home in Malibu. I think we were hoping it was going to be a nicer day, you know, and, and somehow it didn't turn out that way. It was pretty much like this kind of day. With his hosts inside preparing for lunch, Cat decided to go swimming. But just as he swam beyond the surf, he was caught in a current and pulled out to sea. Suddenly I realized that I was fighting the ocean and the tide was going that way and I wasn't getting any closer. The fear of death struck me and I suddenly held myself and I said, Oh God, if you save me, I'll work for you. And at that moment, a wave pushed me forward and suddenly I was swimming back with all the energy that I needed and I was back on land 
and I thank God. On that fateful day, Cat Stevens made a solemn promise that he would repay God for sparing his life, but he had no idea how he'd fulfill it. I was just grateful to still be here because I was a lover of life, you know, and I still hadn't worked it out. And now I was given a chance, second chance. For nearly a year, he waited for a sign. It came in the form of a gift from his brother David. He just traveled to uh, Jerusalem, and I suppose it was a, a mini sort of spiritual journey for him. But it's amazing that he discovered another religion. I kind of almost tripped into it by going to the Dome on the Rock, which is the mosque there. I gave my brother the Quran because I felt there was something very special in the religion of Islam. He sat there and he read this thing, and he doesn't do anything lightheartedly. And what he discovered in the Quran is a faith that he says is more familiar than foreign. Kat was learning that, like Christians and Jews, Muslims worship the one God of Abraham. When I first started reading the Quran, it, it wasn't a sudden, you know, bursting light. It wasn't like that. But it was, in a way, an immediate revelation that the first name that I read in the Quran was God's name. Yeah, I never knew that Muslims believed in God. One of the things that really surprised me, which made me feel very at home, was finding the names of all the prophets that I've read in, in the Bible. For the next year, Cat Stevens privately studied the Quran. Unlike his earlier explorations, this spiritual journey was one he seemed intent on completing. To me, it was just a new awakening. And things which I've been writing about, you know, um, come on now, it's freedom calling come on over and find yourself. You know, I was now saying, saying to myself, well, perhaps I'm being confronted with something that I didn't expect to find in my lifetime. You know, possibly the truth. Cat Stevens was a man in the midst of profound change when he set out on the tour he called Magic Hat in November 1975. Inspired by the Quran, Cat Stevens was gradually moving toward the Islamic faith. In early 1977, his spiritual journey continued when he traveled to Jerusalem. There I was, in the middle of, you know, this holy city, walking into this mosque, and I think some Muslims came up to me because, you know, they'd had some problem before, people walking in and trying to cause damage to the mosque. They came up to me and, and they said, um, who are you? I think that was the first time that I said, I'm a Muslim. Translated from Arabic, a Muslim is one who surrenders to God. Stevens was about to do just that fulfilling the promise he'd made after surviving a brush with death in the waters off Malibu. But for a time, Cat Stevens would drift between the worlds of faith and fame. In April 77, he released Is It So? The album harkened back to his earlier work, but songs like I Never Wanted to Be a Star clearly expressed his growing weariness with the trappings of stardom. Cat's focus was clearly shifting. The 29-year-old immersed himself in the study of the Quran. And then Stevens came across a beautiful story that in many ways mirrored his own life. I think that revelation came when I read the Quran and it was the chapter of Joseph, the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob. It was his story that really opened my heart and I started to weep. And I said, this is not the word of a man. This is God's word. Allah Akbar Allah. When I accepted the Quran was indeed a book from God, it was natural for me to accept the Prophet who received this book as being the last Prophet. Allah Akbar. Then, in December 1977, he walked into London's Central Mosque and embraced Islam. Now a true Muslim, Cat Stevens decided to change his name one last time. I suppose the name that I'd always loved was Joseph. In fact, that was the first name of the school that I went to, you know, St. Joseph's. And of course, because of the chapter of the Quran, 
which, which really opened my heart, I said, that's the name. Later, my Arabic teacher was teaching me how to pronounce Arabic. He, I told him that that, that was my choice. He said, can't you use the Arabic pronunciation? I said, yeah, why not? So, Yusuf Islam. I thought it was a hobby right up until the time he embraced Islam. I made no distinction between numerology, Zen Buddhism, salt-free diets. It had happened very quickly. How I found out, I can't remember it, by osmosis. Steve is now Yusuf. But Yusuf still had obligations as Cat Stevens. So in 1978, he made one last album. The appropriately titled Back to Earth was an eloquent farewell. I'm not seeking any more pain Cause I've had enough of that I was now able to make life my art. I now have been singing about, you know, doing so many great things and, and changing the world. Well, the Quran said, you know, to me, if you don't change what's within you, you can't change anything. And so that's where you have to start. There was no more left in me. Back to Earth was his coming down, his getting off. I want to get off, is what he was saying. I want to get off and I want to, I want to be free. Then Yusuf realized he may have to sacrifice the career to which he dedicated so much of his life. Na, 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 na. Being on stage, being highlighted, and being, if you like, the center of attention was in itself slightly idolizing. And um, that, of course, was opposed to what Islam was, was teaching. Gluttony, conceit, competition, envy, sex, drugs, rock and roll. So therefore, it was obvious that I had to readjust myself to my new life. So in May 1978, Yusuf Islam announced the Cat Stevens era was over. It was an unprecedented move. No other star of his stature had walked away so abruptly. From a business point of view, he was really not interested in recording anymore. And since he was the biggest selling artist we had at the time, that was obviously disappointing. Billy Joel once said that if the devil was going to go into business, he would go into the music business. The music business is about egos. It's about inflating egos. Islam is very much opposite that kind of ethic. It's about diminishing the power of the ego. Away from the limelight, Yusuf Islam began privately practicing his faith. The director of London's Central Mosque remembers that the congregation welcomed Yusuf, but were uncertain what to make of the former superstar. The British community in general regarded this also with both fascination, admiration, and shall I say mystification as well. Because what on earth, what is there in Islam to make a man abandon fame and fortune so easily? While his family came to understand and support his decision, Yusuf Islam was now building a new life and leaving his past behind. He seemed to fall in love with the religion and when it came to marriage, he was very wise in as much as um, he went along the route of the arranged marriage. And I think he had a couple of choices. And I remember bringing them home to see mum, you know, and have like dinner. Uh, and then after that I asked my mother, you know, well, which girl do you think I should marry, you know? Uh, and she said, and she, she told me which one. And she was right. Yusuf was married on September 7th, 1979, and was looking forward to becoming a father. Yusuf loved children. Over the years, he had made several trips to Africa and Bangladesh as the goodwill ambassador for UNICEF. So when he was asked to play at a children's benefit concert, he readily agreed. The thousands who came to London's Wembley Stadium on November 22nd, 1979, witnessed the final performance of Cat Stevens. Many fans and friends grappled with why someone with such a God-given talent would turn his back to it. It's not time to make a change.
just relax, take it easy. It was strange, sad, and it was the basis of a great deal of my career, so it was a vast change for me. I'd been very, very fortunate in, in attaching myself to a major talent, so for a while there was a sense of loss. And I know that I have to go away. I know I have to go away. Yusuf Islam donated much of his fortune to humanitarian causes. He gave up alcohol and erasing any hope of a return to the stage. He auctioned off all his musical instruments, giving the proceeds to charity. I was giving up a kind of a, a cultural crutch, right? And I didn't need that anymore to walk. I was not able to walk in the light. I said to him, well, I hope you will continue to sing. Oh, he said, no, 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 I have given it up. Why not? Why, why have you? Why have you given it up for? And he said that, um, well, he was told that it was haram. It was not allowed in Islam. I said, well, that's a view which is not really the sound view. There were times when I listened to a lot of people, even as Muslims, telling me which way to go. And I was, you know, I was a little bit uh, confused because there were different messages. Because there was nothing in the Quran which told me that music is forbidden. It doesn't say, music thou shalt not play. I always took the, the safest path. For Yusuf, the safe path meant abiding by a conservative Muslim view of music. If he was ever to perform again, he would use nothing more than his voice and percussion. Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah, by the beginning of Bismillah. In 1981, inspired by the birth of his first child, a little girl called Hasana, Yusuf Islam returned to writing. His first new work was a song called A is for Allah, a children's guide to Islam. He is very, very concerned with the blossoming, if you like, of an Islamic Western culture. And the best place to be with that is, is within education. What's your name? Did you see me No, you know who I am? Yeah, I love. Yes. Yes. In 1983, Yusuf used his own money to create the UK's first all-Muslim school called Islamia. I wasn't clever, I wasn't an academic, but I knew I had a job to do, and that was to teach my child, you know, not only the academic aspects and general subjects, but to, how to live. His work on behalf of Muslim children pushed Yusuf Islam back onto the front page, and he reluctantly became an unofficial spokesman for his new faith, a role he would soon pay a high price for. Oh, I'm on my way, I know I am Somewhere not so far from here By the mid-1980s, pop star Cat Stevens had vanished into the shadows. Now, Yusuf Islam emerged into the light. He worked tirelessly for Muslim causes around the world and was compelled to serve as a spokesman for the Islamic community. Yet the media viewed his every move with suspicion. Then in February 1989, he was drawn into a controversy which for a time would eclipse a decade of good deeds. When British author Salman Rushdie was about to publish his novel, The Satanic Verses, it caused an outrage in Muslim communities around the world. They alleged that the author committed blasphemy by insulting God and his prophets. I was contacted by someone saying there's a book coming out uh, and uh, will you join a petition to write to the publishers? And that's what we did, you know, it was very simple. The petition to stop the book's distribution failed. Then the already volatile situation was ignited. Iran's Islamic leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, issued a judgment or a fatwa calling for the death of Salman Rushdie. I found myself somehow being pushed up to the front of the, of the vanguard of this kind of struggle um, and being asked to comment. Because our aim is an ideal society. I mean, if you Within days of the controversy erupting, 
Yusuf Islam found himself in the hot seat, pressed to explain the Quran's position on blasphemy. Yusuf, a recent convert, said, like the Bible, the Quran states that blasphemy is a capital offense. I'd done enough studying at that point to be able to actually sort of more or less quote, you know, uh, chapter and verse and, and the commentary um, of religious texts based on the Quran, um, of which there are different opinions. But I said, well, yeah, it says, says this. Next day, you know, the headline read, Cat says kill Rushdie. You know, and I was horrified. The newspapers had it wrong. He never endorsed the fatwa on Rushdie's life. I was simply a new Muslim who had stated something which I thought was quite simple. And, and if you were to ask a Bible student, you know, what the Ten Commandments were, you, you would expect him to read that and you wouldn't blame him for that. Appalled by the media's distortion of his comments, Yusuf immediately released a statement to clarify his position. It read, that is not to say I am encouraging people to break the law or take it into their own hands. Far from it. It went on to say, Under Islamic law, Muslims are bound to keep within the limits of the law of the country in which they live, providing that it does not restrict the freedom to worship and serve God and fulfill their basic religious duties. I think I was a little bit naive many times. Um, perhaps I, I should have... Uh, thought a little bit more b before answering uh, but then again you know I was expecting that people had good intentions but it's not like that in the end few in the media paid attention to his attempts to set the record straight there are no words I can use because the meaning still leaves for you to choose Yusuf Islam's reputation was seriously tarnished by the controversy. Some shops advised their customers to stop buying Cat Stevens records, and one American DJ even destroyed them. Driving a steamroller over my records, and I thought, strange thing to do, you know. <laughs> the most unfortunate thing about this whole episode was, I suppose, the way in which it, it separated me from my fans and from those people who had appreciated my words and my life and my journey. He had to pay the price. From suddenly being the star, he had to become the anti-star as a result. He had to be the sort of reviled one almost. It, it just had to happen. When I realized what was happening, I felt there was a time to get proactive. It became obvious that we can't just let others talk about what we believe. Now, convinced he had to do something to promote a greater understanding of his faith, Yusuf decided to record once more. His life ever shines as a symbol of light and guidance for all time and for all people. In 1995, he released The Life of the Last Prophet, a CD of song and spoken word. The record told the story of God's messenger, Muhammad. Muhammad Rasulullah. I wanted someone who was coming from a Western background, who knew very little or nothing, about this man, about this religion, to tell them in one hour what it's all about. The experience was a turning point for Yusuf. Now he realized music still had a purpose. It could educate. It could serve his faith. Oh, the white moon rolls over us from the valley of water. I think he was recognizing he'd been a bit too stiff, a bit too rigid in the past, and that you really have to take a much more fluid position. It's not all black and white. In many cases, music can have many, many positive effects. It can be very beautiful, it can be therapeutic, it can be, it can raise people's spirits. And we owe it to show gratefulness where the call is to Allah. If Yusuf had any question that music could again play an important role in his life, he would find his answer under the harshest of circumstances. Fierce fighting has erupted in Bosnia. There are said to be an enormous number of casualties in Sarajevo. In the early 90s, the world woke up, slowly and belatedly, to the brutal conflict that was being waged in the former Yugoslavia. The battle lines were drawn along ethnic and religious lines. It's unimaginable to see how some human beings behave, you know, uh, in with blind prejudice. 
here it was, you know, in the middle of Europe, the end of the 20th century, another genocide taking place. Oh, they've killed all the little ones while their faces still smiled. There was nothing to help them on the day that they died. No longer to laugh, no longer to be a child. Yusuf Islam began a humanitarian project to support the victims of the war by sending food and medical supplies. That aid was used by people like Dr. Irfan Lubyankic. Dr. Lubyankic, who also served as Bosnia's foreign minister, traveled to England on a diplomatic mission in 1995. While in London, he visited Yusuf to thank him for his efforts. I was really honored that, that he, you know, as, as a doctor, as a symbol in a way of the defiance and the strength of the Bosnian nation, how he as a doctor had worked selflessly in the basement of, of Sarajevo, helping put together broken limbs and shot off, you know, arms and, and legs. And this man, to me, was a brave man. Before he returned to Sarajevo, Dr. Lubyankic gave Yusuf Islam a gift. A tape of a song he'd written about the enduring spirit of the Bosnian people. Just three months later, Yusuf received horrible news. Dr. Lubyankic was killed when his helicopter was shot out of the sky. And I remember walking into his office that the day he'd heard this news and he just looked, you know, palpably shocked. That was the moment when I realized that the song he left me was something that I had to now do something with. I have no candles at war, but I have faith in God and love. The song was called I Have No Cannons That Roar and became the title track of an album of contemporary and traditional Bosnian music produced and financed by Yusuf Islam. And I surrender you to no one else, my mother, Bosnia, my to the Western ear, they do sound a bit strange when you first hear them. But, so I think Yusuf kind of picked up on that and realized that actually making a record like this was more just to raise awareness. And Yusuf didn't stop with the record. On November 15th, 1997, he drew world attention to the plight of the Bosnian people by stepping onto a Sarajevo stage. That night, in front of 10,000 survivors, he celebrated the spirit of their culture by giving his first live performance in nearly two decades. Nabi Allah, Nabi Allah, Shafi Allah. Facing an audience again after 17 years wasn't, wasn't particularly easy, but at the same time, because I had this wonderful support of people whose spirits were so strong and so uh, vital, it lifted me. It's so quiet in the ruins Walking through the old town Stones crumbling under my feet I see smoke for miles around Now a fragile peace holds in the streets of Sarajevo but the city and its people still bear the scars of war. Assalamu alaikum. We have come to see how, uh, how you are now and how we can continue to support you. So we're here not just to sing, you know, but to actually help rebuild lives. Helping families, victims, invalids. Uh, that, to me, brings harmony to life. And songs give a background. If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. In Bosnia, Yusuf has set up a foundation to aid orphans, the disabled, and the displaced. It is only one of more than a dozen charities he supports through fundraising and with the substantial royalties he continues to receive from the music he made as Cat Stevens. Back in the old days, so nice to see you coming back in this town again. It's nice to see a friendly face come peeking through. Haven't seen the afternoon now. Have 
paradoxically, the world he lives in today, the Islamic world, um, he's just as busy. They make just as many demands on him. He's never got any time to do anything. In fact, he works harder now than he ever did as a pop star. He's like a virtuoso musician without an instrument. It's so nice to see you coming back in this town. Music, movies, the F. Oh, I've been happy lately, thinking about the good things to come. And I believe it could be something good has begun. From Mozambique to Malaysia, from the Sudan to Turkey, Yusuf Islam travels extensively as a humanitarian ambassador and philanthropist. These trains sound in loud Everywhere I go, there are people ready to shake my hand, wanting to, to meet me and talk to me, and just listen to my experience. Hoş geldiniz. Assalamu alaikum. Hoş geldiniz. Assalamu alaikum. So oftentimes, I, I'm, I'm asked to just give talks and lectures in universities. I started reflecting my thoughts and those questions which were knocking at my conscience. I started writing those kind of lyrics in my songs. It's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful road. I know we've come a long way, we're changing day to day. Back home in England, the father of five remains a vocal activist for education. Yusuf started his first school in 1983. Today, he runs four. And after 15 years of lobbying, he helped convince the British government to grant one of them funding. It was a significant victory in overcoming the prejudices his faith often faces. All I try to do is to give a helping hand either give charity or educate, you know, or, or stand up for human and spiritual rights. How great the beauty of the earth and the creatures who dwell on her. My religion teaches me to worship God and, and to care for the poor and the oppressed. And I think nobody's going to change my religion. So that's my work and that's my life. Here to our signs. God is the light, God is the light. Today, Yusuf's work includes a spiritual and cultural media enterprise. As a new generation is quickly discovering, the former pop star is still a creative and influential force. I use the development and the production of my albums, my books, you know, to, if you like, express my art. And I'm very happy with the way things are going. Mountain of Light is my label through which I, I kind of express my artistic tenets. There's very few people of his sort of fame and wealth who've actually directed it to sort of something really positive. He's actually done a lot of real, real good things with it. I mean, he's not necessarily done everything right. Because I will learn to understand If I have a helping hand I wouldn't make another demand All my life after much searching, the man the world loved as Cat Stevens has found his answer. And faith has brought him a fulfillment that fame and fortune could not. It's the answer lies within. So why not take a look now? Pick out the devil's in. Pick up, pick up the good book now. Ooh. His is an amazing journey with a moral foretold in the enduring words he wrote and the songs he sang all those years ago. I wouldn't see myself in any way slipping back into those old boots you know, that I used to wear, whatever color. But definitely communication uh, is my business now. And I think that music is one of the forms of communication. It's, it's an international language. So whatever will speak to people, you know, whatever people will be ready to listen to, I'll be there, I hope.